All right. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Thank you for coming to this workshop on renewables, renewables in crisis. My name is Ferdi de Ville. I am an um, assistant professor uh, in European trades and monetary policies at the Center for EU Studies uh, at Kent University. I'm not a real expert in renewable energy policy, so I've learned already a lot during this uh, conference, uh, and I'm looking forward uh, to learn a lot more also during this workshop. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank the organizers uh, for asking me to chair this workshop uh, and, and for organizing this uh, fantastic conference. Now let me start by introducing to you our three distinguished speakers here. Um, and I must say that I am very honored uh, to chair a panel, panel with them as uh, participants. I think uh, Mr. Hans-Josef Fell, who perhaps doesn't even need an introduction, has already been uh, introduced during the previous session, so I will not do that uh, again. Um, at your left, at my right, is Professor Dr. Uh, Rolf Wustenhagen. He is a director. Um, he is director of the Institute for Economy and the Environment, and holds the Good Energies Chair for Management of Renewable Energies at the University of St. Gallen. His research focuses on decision making under uncertainty by energy investors, consumers, and entrepreneurs. He embarked on an academic career after retiring from one of the leading European energy venture capital funds. And from 2008 until 2011, he served as a lead author for the IPCC on the special reports on renewable energy and climate change mitigation. Since 2011, he is a member of the advisory board for the Swiss government's uh, energy strategy 2050. Then at your uh, right um, is uh, Mr. Jose Donoso. He's working uh, in the renewable energy sector for uh, more than 25 years already uh, now. Uh, and he started his career at the Institute for the Diversification and Saving of Energy, then joined uh, Gamesa as Director of uh, Promotion and is currently the Director General of the Spanish Photovoltaic Union. So I think we have uh, three very interesting speakers here looking maybe at uh, the topic of the workshop from three um, different European countries, of which two are European Union uh, countries. So already this um, offers a good opportunity uh, for debates. Um, I think there are also three countries that I believe have been at one point in time been considered as leaders in uh, renewable energy and also three countries who have been confronted by the financial economic crisis uh, in very different uh, ways. So all uh, very interesting angles, I think, uh, on, on this topic. So we will be talking um, the remainder of this morning about the effects of the financial economic, and since 2010, within the European Union, especially a sovereign debt and a euro crisis, on renewable energy policy, um, and then particularly on renewable energy policy within Europe. Now, I think when we think about this topic, then in theory we can think about effects of the crisis on renewable energy um, that could run uh, theoretically in two directions. I think we all, of course, tend to think first about the negative effects of the crisis on renewable energy policy. Uh, negative effects that um, could be summarized as financial, economic and political challenges to renewable energy policy within Europe. Uh, examples are the cuts in subsidies for renewable energy, the decrease of the oil price because of uh, the financial economic crisis, which, as we all know, a more than 75% plunge in the winter of 2008-2009. The crash of the carbon price uh, in the European Union's emission trading scheme with up to 90% of the carbon price. 
but also, of course, the crisis, in, crisis uh, reinforcing already existing fears about the European Union's competitiveness within the global economy. And Professor Wüstenhagen will uh, talk about that uh, in his presentation. Also, of course, the political problem of finding agreements amongst 27 member states in times of um, increasing Euro fatigue and also even Euroscepticism within uh, member states. Um, now, uh, Ms. Cecile Mansonneuf, uh, for um, the ones amongst you who were here yesterday, made, I think, a very nice uh, analogy between the monetary system and the problems within the monetary system uh, in Europe, um, and then especially the lack of an optimal currency area um, in the uh, euro area, and the problems we have in the EU's energy uh, system, where there are maybe similar uh, deficiencies within the system. And we can um, reflect upon this analogy maybe in the course of, of this workshop. But at the same time, I think we could imagine that the crisis would mean an, an impetus, uh, a boost to renewable energy in Europe. Investing in green technology and in renewable energy capacity could provide for the necessary stimulus to the European economies that are still very much stuck today. Secondly, after the instability of the financial system within Europe, but also globally, of course, after this has been exposed by the crisis and in persistent times of um, insecurity, within this sector, maybe the renewable energy sector could be a sector that provides great opportunities for investments. Uh, maybe this is a certain growth uh, sector in the global and the European economy in uh, the future, and even more so after the crisis in the financial sector. Also, analysts say that about half of the European Union's existing power capacity will have to be replaced in the next decades. So we are at a moment um, of, um, of, of great uh, opportunities to invest in the renewable energy sector uh, and, and in this way uh, give a boost to the um, flagging European economy. So in sum, I think it would be interesting to structure the discussion of this workshop around the question how we could channel the effects of the crisis uh, on renewable energy in a positive uh, way, in a positive direction. So I propose we go uh, in the order of um, the program and um, I would like to give the three speakers around five to ten minutes uh, to give some introductory statements. Then I will give them the opportunity to react um, to uh, each other's statements uh, and then maybe I will we'll ask some additional questions and then open the floor to you for Q&A. So Mr. Fell, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Schön. Is that okay when I speak in Deutsch? Rede? Yeah, that fällt mir leichter. Um, thank you, Schön. I will also try not to too much to wiederholen from the first discussion. Und doch ein paar neue Aspekte zu beleuchten. Ich glaube, es sind ja in diesem Workshop vor allem zwei Leitfragen. Die eine ist gerade erwähnt worden, nämlich welchen Einfluss hat die aktuelle Finanzkrise, die Schuldenkrise, die Eurokrise auf die Energiewende Europas. Und es war auch eine andere Leitfrage, die ich genauso spannend fand, nämlich sind die erneuerbaren Energien in einer Krise? Darüber wird ja auch sehr viel zu diskutieren sein und ich will eine erste übergeordnete Antwort auf die zweite Frage geben. Ja, die erneuerbaren Energien sind europaweit in einer massiven politischen Krise. Und die zweite Antwort auf diese Frage ist, nein, die erneuerbaren Energien sind nicht in der Krise. Wie kommt dieser Widerspruch zustande? Das will ich versuchen aufzulösen. Aber zunächst mal zur Frage Schuldenkrise. Hier ist eigentlich die klare Antwort, aus der Schuldenkrise kommen wir nur mit ökonomischen 
nachhaltigem Wachstum heraus, mit Investment in neue wirtschaftliche Tätigkeiten, mit Arbeitsplatz schaffen. Nur so können wir die Schuldenkrise überwinden. Wir haben keine Wachstumsmärkte in den alten Technologien, die groß genug sind, um dort wirklich Anschub leisten zu können. Deswegen wäre die Ökologisierung Europas exakt das Konjunkturprogramm, das Europa aus dieser Krise herausbringen kann und zwar in vielfältiger Hinsicht. Zum einen das, was ich heute Vormittag schon erwähnt habe, zur Vermeidung der fossilen Rohstoffimporte, die überall schon die Tragfähigkeit der Finanzkraft der vor allem südlichen Länder Europas übersteigt. Zum anderen aber in Investment in die neuen Technologien, die dann eben Arbeitsplätze schaffen und weiteres. Das Problem ist, dies ist nicht strategisch erkannt, weder von der EU-Ebene noch von der Nationalstaatenebene. Gerade Griechenland, ich war viel in Griechenland, habe sehr geworben dafür, dass nicht der Export mit einem Helios-Projekt von Solarstrom nach Deutschland Griechenland retten kann, was die glaubten der Energieminister Papa Konstantino dort, sondern die Umstellung der eigenen griechischen Energiewirtschaft auf Windkraft, Geothermie, Solarkraft, Wellenenergie und vieles mehr. Nutzung der Abfallbiomasse im Biogas. Was findet statt? Vor 14 Tagen hat der Finanzausschuss des Deutschen Bundestages gegen die grüne Opposition sein Votum gegeben für eine Hermesbürgschaft, für ein neues großes Braunkohlekraftwerk in Griechenland. Übrigens hat die Bundesregierung vor einem Jahr festgelegt, aufgrund der unsicheren griechischen Verhältnisse gibt es keine Hermesbürgschaften nach Griechenland mehr für erneuerbare Energieninvestitionen. Absurde Verhältnisse, die noch dadurch getoppt werden können, dass ja dort in der Tat keine ausreichenden guten Good Governance ist. Derjenige, der die Hermesbürgschaften vor allem beantragt hat, der Geschäftsführer von PPC, ist letzten Freitag in Athen verhaftet worden, weil er den Gewerkschaften Geld gegeben hat zur Unterstützung des Braunkohlekraftwerks Investitionen. Den Sumpf muss man sich mal richtig angucken und damit auch, was in Deutschland so passiert und womit letztendlich dann doch verhindert wird, dass in diesen Ländern wirklich die ökonomische Transition stattfinden kann, die wir brauchen und die die Chancen haben. Wir sind weit weg von den nationalen um, Strategien in dieser Richtung. Wir sind das aber auch europaweit. Wenn wir uns aktuell anschauen, wie eines der großen Highlights mit neuen Technologien, Investitionen, neuen Fabriken in der Solarwirtschaft aktuell in Europa und in Deutschland zugrunde geht, vorgeschoben das Argument, die Chinesen sind mit Dumping auf dem Weltmarkt und da können wir leider nichts tun, Weder ein Wettbewerbskommissar noch ein Energiekommissar noch ein Industriekommissar fällt irgendwas ein in der Solarbranche. Wenn es der Automobilwirtschaft mit Problemen aus China geht, dann haben die ganz schnell Lösungen. Die deutsche Bundesregierung auch, Abrackprämie, wir erinnern uns noch und vieles weitere. Und hier Hilflosigkeit zugrunde geht diese, weil wir keine klare Solarindustriepolitik haben zur Stützung dieser neuen Technologien. Und diese fehlende Solarindustriepolitik kommt eben daraus, weil immer noch die massiven Einflüsse der Kohle, Erdöl, Erdgas, Nuklearindustrie bei den Regierenden Europas da sind. Erneuerbare Energien, ich sagte ja, sie sind politisch in der Krise. Und das kann man an vielen nationalstaatlichen Entscheidungen auch festmachen. Wir hatten in Stechien zwei Jahre einen richtigen Ausbauboom in der Photovoltaik, bei Windkraft, Biogas und anderen. Ähnliche Verhältnisse wie in Deutschland, zivilgesellschaftliche neue Akteure mit einem erneuerbaren Energiengesetz. Im vorletzten Jahr schon hat, die tschechische, hat das tschechische Parlament die Einspeisevergütung abgeschafft, hat rückwirkend eine Besteuerung darauf gegeben. Man muss sich das mal vorstellen, rückwirkend wird in gesetzlich gesicherte Einspeisevergütung eingegriffen in einem Staat, der vor 13 Jahren noch das Eigentum mit kommunistischen Fragen missachtet hat. 
heute findet das dort wieder statt und das scheint gang und gäbe zu sein. Wir haben sogar in Deutschland das diskutiert. In den Vorschlägen von Herrn Altmaier und Rösler waren rückwirkende Eingriffe in die Einspeisevergütung einer der Punkte für die angebliche Strompreisbremse. Das muss man sich mal vorstellen. Letztendlich hat Frau Merkel auch mit Herrn Seehofer zusammen die beiden zurückgepfiffen auf dem letzten ähm, Energiegipfel und erneuerbaren Energiengipfel. Und das Ergebnis dort lässt sich schnell auf den Punkt bringen. Wir halten doch das Grundgesetz ein. <lacht> Denn es ist ja grundgesetzwidrig, diese rückwirkenden Eingriffe zu machen. Also wir haben in diesem Denken, erneuerbare Energien sind ein Problem, sind Preistreiber, sie sind natürlich in Wirklichkeit der Angriff auf das fossil-atomare Energiesystem, das wir aber abschaffen müssen aus Klimaschutzgründen und vielen anderen Gründen. Haben wir nun Entwicklungen in Europa, die an den Grundfesten der europäischen Verfassungen und an stabilen Verhältnissen eigentlich angreifen? Und wir diskutieren das gar nicht in diesem Maße. Und es ist nicht nur in Tschechien, wo das passiert ist. Auch in Spanien haben wir rückwirkende Eingriffe in die Einspeisevergütungen und Abschaffungen des EEGs. Wir haben es aktuell in Griechenland. Dort wird auch eine sehr erfolgreiche Ausbausituation erneuerbarer Energien rückwirkend kaputt gemacht. Wir haben aber auch positive Verhältnisse. Großbritannien hat den Wechsel vom untauglichen Quotensystem hin zu Einspeisesystemen geschafft. Ganz interessant, obwohl die natürlich auch noch an anderem arbeiten, nämlich an dem Einspeisevergütungssystem für Atomenergie. So ist das sehr durchwachsen. Und von den politischen Verhältnissen ist es im Moment eher eine abschwingende Situation für die Unterstützung der erneuerbaren Energien. Und das zeigt sich auch in den Aktivitäten der EU-Kommission. Das haben wir vorhin diskutiert, auch in dem Versuch aus dem EU-Parlament. Herr Reul, CDU-Abgeordneter im Parlament, hat einen Bericht zu erneuerbaren Energien vorgelegt, in dem er eben die Abschaffung der Einspeisevergütung gefordert hat. Erfreulich ist, und dort widerspricht es meiner These, dass wir politisch unter Druck wären, der ITRA-Ausschuss hat diesen Bericht zurückgewiesen. Und ich hoffe, dass es im Plenum im Europaparlament in der, ich glaube, übernächste Woche oder irgendwann in den nächsten Wochen wird das sein, dass es dort auch stabil hält und dass eben doch im Mittelpunkt die tauglichen Systeme für die Energiewende dort festgeschrieben werden und als positiv dargestellt werden. Der mächtige Industrieausschuss, der federführend ist dafür, hat es bereits getan. Übrigens auch wieder hier ein großer Erfolg unseres grünen Abgeordneten Claude Turms, der das wieder in seiner bekannten Genialität geschafft hat. Nun, wenn es jetzt aber da nicht die Möglichkeit gibt, das, was Herr Oettinger wollte, nämlich von seinem Parteifreund sich eine Prokura aus dem Europaparlament geben zu lassen, das zu tun, was er nicht tun darf, weil er keine Energiekompetenz hat, dann muss man natürlich in der EU-Kommission noch weiter fragen, wie schaffen wir es. Und da kommt dann natürlich der Binnenmarkt in den Blick. Wir haben das heute früh diskutiert. Offensichtlich ist, weil die europäische Ebene nach Lissabon-Verträgen im Binnenmarkt Kompetenz hat, nun das das übergeordnete Kriterium. Es wird nicht diskutiert, dass wir natürlich auch Kompetenz auf europäischer Ebene im Umweltschutz haben und dort genauso die Aufgaben machen müssen. Und der beste Klimaschutz sind die erneuerbaren Energien zusammen mit den Effizienztechnologien. Und da wundere ich mich immer, dass die EU-Kommission stark immer nur den Binnenmarkt pusht und nicht die Kompetenz des Umweltschutzes heraushebt. Und da kommen gefährliche Baustellen. So will die EU-Kommission demnächst alle Beihilfetatbestände im erneuerbaren Energiensektor überprüfen. Ich frage mich, warum nicht im fossilen Sektor, warum nicht im Nuklearsektor? Dort sind sie massiv vorhanden. Und dort will sie prüfen, ob das erneuerbare Energiengesetz Deutschland zu so die Einspeisevergütung eine Beihilfe im Sinne der EU-Kommission ist. Sie drängen darauf, es zu machen, denn dann hätte die Kommission wieder den Griff drauf. Denn über Beihilfe könnte sie ja dann wieder ihre Vorstellungen mit Richtlinien und anderen machen, denn da haben sie wieder Kompetenz im Sinne des Wettbewerbs. Sehr gefährlich. Zum Schluss noch die These, warum sind erneuerbare Energien doch nicht in der Krise? Nicht wirklich. Der Bericht der EU-Kommission von letzter Woche zur Entwicklung der erneuerbaren Energien hat beleuchtet, der Ausbau geht schneller als nach dem 20-Prozent-Ziel bis 2020 ähm, 
angepeilt ist. Die Zwischenziele sind schon übererfüllt, europaweit. Das heißt nicht, dass es in jedem Staat so ist. Das heißt aber, dass es doch in der Summe so ist. Wie kommt das zustande? Nun, wir haben eine ganz interessante Situation erreicht. Nach den letzten zehn Jahren, wo vor allem Deutschland etwas mithilfe Dänemark, aber auch Spaniens und anderer Länder, aber vor allem Deutschlands als Technologieindustrieland die Erneuerbaren billig gemacht haben mit dem EEG im Stromsektor, führt dazu, dass sie jetzt billig sind. Und damit auch ohne staatliche Regulationen in sehr vielen Investitionsfällen schon wettbewerbsfähig sind. Dies ist eine neue Situation, die gilt es viel stärker in den Blick zu nehmen und auch in der Zivilgesellschaft a. bewusst zu machen und in Investitionen anzustoßen. Und wir sehen genau das in Deutschland. Es sind nicht E.ON und RWE, die die Investitionen Erneuerbare machen. Es sind die Bürgergenossenschaften, die Stadtwerke, die Landwirte. Es sind viele Millionen Menschen aus der Zivilgesellschaft, die investieren. Das findet auch schon teilweise in anderen Ländern statt. Ich kenne Genossenschaften in Griechenland, die das tun, die also trotz der Blockaden von oben es schon versuchen anzugehen aus der blanken Not heraus. Sie haben eh keine Geschäftstätigkeiten mehr, die müssen sich irgendwas suchen. Vielleicht ist das dann ein Hoffnungsanker, wenn schon Regierungen es nicht organisieren können, dass wir die zivilgesellschaftlichen Prozesse mehr pushen. Da ist die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung zum Beispiel sehr aktiv, auch dies immer wieder zu tun. Und dies auch verstärkt in den Blick zu nehmen und darüber dann die Widerstände doch in den Griff zu bekommen. Denn eines wollen die Menschen, billige Energie. Und die können in Zukunft nur noch mit Erneuerbaren geleistet werden, weil die Brennstoffkosten frei sind und nicht in der Abhängigkeit der Ölpreise sind, die trotz Shellgas hype weiter steigen werden und nach oben immer höhere Belastungen sind. Und? Sie schaffen ökonomische Bedingungen, sie schaffen Arbeitsplätze, bringen unseren jungen Leuten, die frisch aus der Uni kommen und in den südlichen Ländern verzweifelt einen Job suchen, eine Chance, hier etwas Interessantes und auch Wertvolles zu tun. Ich sehe es also auch an positiver Seite durchaus optimistisch, denn dieser ökonomische Weg ist der entscheidende und das haben wir schon geschafft mit grüner Politik der letzten zehn Jahre. Thank you, Mr. Fell. Uh, already some good and some bad news to take home. Um, renewable energies have matured, but maybe politicians within Europe have not followed uh, suit um, as well as we uh, hope, hoped. I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Donoso, who is coming from a country that maybe has evolved from a leader in the renewable energy um, sector to a little bit or is risking of becoming a laggard maybe because of the crisis. Okay, it's okay? Yeah. Okay, I, I will... Uh, I would like to start uh, with a general reflection because the situation in Spain, I think, is not so particular. It's more dramatic than in other countries before for some specific condition. But I think it's... Um, General, in general terms, is related with general tendencies that we have in this moment in the Western countries in relation with renewable energies. We, we, est, we achieve a historical moment with, uh, I share the opinion of Mr. Fell, that we can consider renewable energy as a success, but when I arrive at this moment that we are a success, we are in the most dangerous moment of the last 25 years. Uh, why? If uh, we do one uh, bitter interpretation of the facts, we can say, okay, we achieve a degree of competitiveness, we are reduced cost, but not enough speed. The crisis arrived and we are not ready to be co competitive with conventional technologies. Now, environment is out of the table, out of the agenda, of the people, and environment was our driver when we start 25 years ago. And it's out. The people now are only interested in cut, cut cost, any kind of cost. And energy is no more one uh, problem that must be related with a more clean way to, produ to produce energy. 
energy even is no more one uh, way of technological development. Energy now is only an input for our industry. And uh, policymakers are only take this element in consideration. But paradoxically, we are comp near to be uh, full competitive in a fake competitiveness. Because for me, the real reason that we have now these problems is for us for a failure of 25 years ago. 25 years ago, when we started, and we must uh, thanks to Germany for the, the big impulse that gave to this discussion of a more the necessity of a model of energy more clean. Okay, I remember this discussion at the, the level of the European Union. I have the, the opportunity to participate directly. This time, the key was, okay, the society is not paying accurate price for energy because we have a dirty model that, and we not include in the price of the energy the external cost. And then was the idea of the CO2 tax, the famous at this time CO2 tax. And was some kind of rebellion inside the European Union say, oh no, we are lost competitiveness, this is crazy. We can put to our industry a CO2 tax. Let's go to follow another model. Let's go to give a medal to the guys that produce clean energy. Let's go to them to be competitive with some kind of feeding system, feed system, green certificates or any other, to give a medal to the, these uh, renewable energies. Okay, it was a nice idea for everybody. At this time, renewable energy was no much more than a nice picture for the annual report of the utilities or the idea of uh, a few crazy people in Europe. And the idea looks, that was nice, because the, uh, we don't affect competitiveness, we can create our, we can continue developing renewable energy in nice conditions, but now, at right the moment, that we are successful, too successful for many people because we have a cake that is energy consumption. This cake, against all the expectation, because when we was in the old years, now it looks very old years, looks that the growth will, be, will continue without a stop, never. And then the cake of the energy consumption will be every, big, every day biggest, and we'll have cake for everybody. But now <clears throat> the cake is smaller. In my case, in Spain, we have the, the reduction of consumption of energy, the biggest reduction from this, our civil war, or by uh, 4.5 less consumption of energy. This was not be believable before. Never can imagine this scenario. And at the same time, we have in the last days, in these last weeks, the 50% of our electricity is produced for renewable energies. And then we are an enemy for competitors. We are not more one nice picture for annual report. We, we are something that is taking a big part of the cake. And now they say, okay, we, the support scheme is no more sustainable. But my support scheme are not more sustainable. But for the society, are sustainable that you are continue not externalizing the cost? We need to put again this question in the agenda. If no, looks that they are the economical reason. We need good energy, but we are sub subsidizing. We continue subsidizing conventional energies. And I think this is the problem, on the, uh, the, pro the real problem that we have. The demand is decreasing, the cake is small, we are not over competitive in the way that we can uh, compete, compete in this uh, repeat fake condition of the market. And if we don't put the environment in the agenda, if, if we don't redrive the discussion, we have only a remote future when nice years will come back again. But it will be very difficult for us European technologists to survive to this crisis with the strong concurrence from China, from other parts that they continue growing. 
And then we have in Spain a very dramatic case because we have, we are very unlucky. Uh, we have a conservative party in these difficult days. We have a conservative party in the power, but more on the conservative party. In the energy, we have the Tea Party of the conservative party in the power. It's people that came from a foundation as this one, from the conservative party that uh, really believe that the, the best world is a world full of nuclear energy with some combined cycles and without no renewable energies. Only one month later they took the power, they introduced a moratoria forbidden, forbidden, don't allow to continue doing new project of renewable energies. But more of that, <clears throat> we are suffering, suffering a series of reforms with aspect of retroactivity. That uh, means that this year, for instance, the people that invested in PV project several years ago are receiving more or less a 40% less than he for is in his business plan. They want to eradicate. They have plans even that I believe that are so, so stupid that they will not implement it, that even they uh, uh, eradicate PV projects. They consider they were very expensive and the best is to finish with uh, the project of PV. Okay, <clears throat> it's a dramatic situation a little bit exaggerate for the coincidence of the people that have the energy responsibilities in my country in this moment, but it's a tendency. And we have um, how we must uh, go to the future. First, I, we need to put environment, we need on the agenda. In very delicate moment, but they will come back with the argument of 25 years ago and with the uh, for the, st the force of the crisis, say, we reduce competitiveness of the European Union, but it's, it's the real world. If not, we need an, another kind of compensation. But we need to continue with research and development. And we think we have a win-win way the future. This morning, we in the table, round table of before, you, you challenge with the comparison between railways, uh, railway sector or telecommunication sector. Energy until now was a railway sector, but with the degree of competitiveness of uh, photovoltaic in relation to the grid parity, the deg uh, and the future that that means, the, the road that will, re will go with this competitiveness could be net self-consumption, net metering, smart grids, city, smart cities. That could believe, I believe, that could mean a transformation, a real revolution in the way of consumption of energy that can put for first time at the citadel and the, and the people in the center of the energy world. That could be a revolution similar to telecommunication in relation to mobile phones with fixed phone. And we need to fight for this revolution because it was the dream of the pioneers 25 years ago that really to change the model of energy does not mean only that big utilities consume, produce energy with, uh, with photovoltaics or wind energy. It's not that the, the people is in the center of the, the real center of decision how to produce energy and how to consume energy. Okay, I think I spoke a lot, but uh, I think we have in a crossroad, we have a big challenge. We are the reason. We, have, we are in the good way, but we don't need to lose this battle because it's key for our future. Thank you, Mr. Donoso. Um, the two previous speakers have already mentioned um, the problem of Chinese competition and the lack of a real response by the European authorities uh, Professor Wustenhagen will elaborate on that and uh, hopefully also conclude with uh, some proposals on how we should respond to that. Thank you. 
Does this microphone work? Yes, it does. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for these two interesting statements. Um, w when I was sitting on the panel, I was asking myself, why have I been invited from Switzerland to join this panel? Um, because it's not always obvious how Switzerland relates to the current crisis. Um, sometimes when you live in Switzerland, I've been living there for 16 years, um, you feel like you're an island which is somehow sort of disconnected from, from other parts of the world. Uh, and the only way that the crisis finds its way to Switzerland is that... Um, the Swiss National Bank thinks about what to do with all the euros that are flowing into the country from some other parts of the world. Um, so the Swiss National Bank currently has 200 billion euros where they don't know what to do with it. Um, so maybe if you have good ideas, we should think about talking to the Swiss National Bank. Well, but there is indeed a link. Um, there's actually two kinds of links. One is that I get called from a journalist from the Swiss National Radio who covers a story about a Swiss utility who, which has been investing in solar energy in Spain. And they asked me, well, what's going on in Spain here and, and why, how come that all this, these nice and sort of promising projects are now looking less promising? Um, how, how can that happen and will that happen in other countries as well? Um, so that's one link. And then the other link is that Switzerland, very similar to that Switzerland does not have an automotive industry but has lots of suppliers. Switzerland does not have a solar industry but has suppliers to the solar industry like Maya Burger, which is one of the leading companies of diamond saws, which you need in, in making solar cells or wafers. Um, and they had great sales to countries like China until two years ago, um, and then all of a sudden that stopped. So there is this complete standstill in the solar industry, which has its effect also on suppliers in Switzerland. So there is a link. So I feel sort of comfortable being here. But I also feel like um, maybe that explains to you why um, I've chosen to talk not about Switzerland, not so much about Europe, um, but about the role of Asia in this whole uh, current crisis. Um, and the overall story is, as hans Josef Fell mentioned, you can look at um, the current situation in the renewable energy market as a glass that is half full or half empty. Well, this one is completely empty now. But um, the, So on one side, you see all this sort of hockey stick growth, so exponential growth in different renewables. You look to Germany and you get really impressed by what's going on in terms of the quick uh, growth. In, in wind and solar, um, but then also you see if you look carefully in which countries this is happening, um, that especially in the wind energy industry for some time now, and maybe also increasingly in the solar industry, this growth has shifted towards the east. So while it used to be uh, countries like, like Germany and Denmark uh, in the old days, including Spain, and then the U.S. for some time, since about 2009, which is the time when the financial crisis really kicked in, um, there's declining sort of numbers of, of new installations in wind energy in the West, but there's a continued growth in countries like China to the extent that in 2010, every second new wind turbine went online in China rather than in other parts of the world. Um, which leads to headlines like this, where um, you see on the one side uh, the German sort of magazine Der Aktionär mentioning a death list of solar companies, that was already two years ago, while at the same time, if you read the news in Asia, like in uh, the journal here, in the, the newspaper in Singapore, you would see the sun rises on solar firms in China. So what's going on? Is the sun setting here and rising in the east? Are we doomed? Are we sort of forced to surrender to China? Well, I'd say not necessarily so, but there is a serious challenge, and I wanted to just elaborate on three thoughts um, on how this links um, between what's going on in Asia and, and over here. The first hypothesis here is that, um, in fact, if we look at both wind and solar, it's not a matter of waiting for some magical technological breakthrough um, or maybe some, some great competitive advantage that China has. I think the main advantage that China has is they have capital and they're willing to spend that capital on renewable energy. Um, my second hypothesis is that the initial growth has been driven by feed-in tariffs, especially in Germany, um, not least thanks to people like hans Josef Fell who have pushed that. Um, going forward, I think um, there needs to be more people brought into the picture of, of actually moving that forward. Um, so if you want, you can put it that way. The world cannot continue to free ride on German electricity consumers who have really pushed this to the point where we're now. Um, and then third and finally, um, I think... The, the real challenge that we have compared to countries like China um, is what's called in innovation studies uh, path dependence. So we are stuck into an existing 
um, electricity system very much uh, the way that we've been stuck into the fixed line telephone business to sort of go back to that analogy. Um, and countries like China have an opportunity to leapfrog um, to not sort of move on uh, that existing path but just sort of go to the next level very similar to what they've done in, in mobile telephony. Just a few pictures and to, to illustrate those three thoughts. The first one is um, we're doing one of the things we're doing in, in Switzerland is an executive education program where we take people uh, once a year to Asia. Um, so two weeks ago, we've visited this wonderful factory on the right side here, which is REC, an 850 megawatt um, production facility for solar wafer cells and modules. Um, and some time ago, I looked at another factory here in, in Germany, Q-Cells. What's the difference between those two? Well, the main difference is that REC in Singapore um, has had more money to play with. They've invested um, more than a billion um, euros to really do a clean factory, which is highly automated, um, which has wafer, cell, and module right next to each other, whereas most of the other uh, factories also in Germany only have one part of the value chain and then ship around the, the, the material to some other place, which leaves some, some room for, for efficiencies untapped. Um, so the big difference here is not necessarily labor cost, Singapore is not necessarily a low-cost country either. Um, the difference really is spending, being willing to, to spend lots of capital. Um, and that's, I think, what the Chinese, uh, where the Chinese have an advantage currently over European firms, um, that the Chinese government and some of those firms are really dedicated to, to make this happen, even though it costs a lot of money for a couple of years. My second point here was about feed-in tariffs. I think they have been really effective, um, but um, in some sense, I think it's now time to move away from this German success story and, and think broader, very similar to the, the previous panel, um, where it's about asking the question, how can other countries get um, involved in, in this um, in this development, because so far there's many countries, including Switzerland, Singapore, and other places in the world, where people still have a very sort of reluctant stance uh, towards solar energy. So I think there's still this need to, to raise awareness in those countries, but also to think about how can they be motivated to be part of this. So I think this event here is really crucial in that regard. And third, I'd say, as I already mentioned, there is this aspect of path dependence. Um, if you look at how um, investments have evolved over the recent years, I've, I've already showed you that graph on, on wind energy. Um, the investments have really gone down with the financial crisis in North America, and they've continued to go up um, in, in China and other parts of Asia. Um, so dealing with that kind of path dependence, I think, is key. You find it, um, as it has been mentioned today, um, for example, in research and development budgets. If you look at the German energy research and development budget, this is what it looked like over the past 50 years or so. Um, nuclear energy has been very prominent, um, and it's very difficult to move away from that. Um, the, uh, Mr. Burkhardt mentioned that it's also difficult to move away from the coal subsidies. I mean, this is path dependence. It's really important to get away um, from that, and that takes some time in countries that have entrenched energy industries, and that takes maybe less time in other places. So my conclusion here is um, there is a unique opportunity to overcome um, the dependence from non-renewable energy, but it is a challenging time, and it's not obvious um, how this can be achieved, especially in the, in the current crisis. I think also because the crisis always can be interpreted as an opportunity or as a threat. I used to work in the financial industry uh, in about 10 years ago, um, which was right after there was this dot-com bubble. Um, so in the sort of up to 2001, it looked like, well, the sky is the limit. Any new technology can find lots of funding, including new energy technologies like fuel cells and others. And then, when this sort of when when capital markets got more more tight, um, this was also a challenge for all these new technologies. They suffered even sort of above average from from sort of the the decline in in capital markets. So. One way of looking at that would be to say, well, crisis is an opportunity. Now let's go to the root cause of the problem and not build brown coal uh, lignite power plants in Greece. Um, but the other side is um, renewable energy firms, like any other firm, need capital. Um, and in, in these current times, it is more challenging to access that capital. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I think the, the challenge really is how can we sort of change people's minds um, towards really taking this crisis as an opportunity and let's go to the root cause of the problem perspective and not looking at what's currently, I think, a dominating perception of um, 
well, now we can't really afford to, to do the right thing. Um, we need to s sort of roll back and, and go back to the, the previous solutions. I don't have a solution here, but I look forward to the further discussion and hope we'll come to a solution then at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wustenhagen, for this very interesting presentation. Um, as you have seen, um, Mr. Fell had to leave. There are other audiences to be uh, convinced, maybe to be more convinced uh, than you are. Um, I think we have another 15 to maybe 20 or 30 minutes even uh, for discussion. I have some um, uh, additional questions, but I would like to give you the opportunity first um, to ask your questions maybe to our two uh, remaining speakers. And if not, then I will follow up with the uh, questions. So who likes to start? Yes, I have two questions over there. You can go to the microphone and uh, please briefly mention your name and affiliation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tina Bear. I'm working for the Regional Bull Foundation in Brandenburg. And we are working a lot on European projects on municipal level. And so if you look at um, European uh, energy development um, on a municipal level, then everyone looks to Spain because you have like uh, more than 900 uh, municipalities member uh, in the Covenant of Mayors. And I just wanted to, uh, to ask you whether you know something about how the um, economic crisis in Spain affects uh, the engagement on the municipal level when it comes to, to energy transformation. Thank you. I will first collect a couple of questions and then you can uh, answer. Yes. My name is Carolina Steinbacher. I'm a PhD student at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, my question goes to the Professor Wüstenhagen. Uh, you underlined the necessity for others to join in the, this journey towards uh, more renewables. In your opinion, how can Germany and other pioneer countries contribute uh, to this development? How can they actively maybe promote renewables abroad and engage others in, into this venture? Thank you. Other questions? No, they will have first round of Responses. Mr. Donoso, I propose you go first. Uh, of course, the economical and financial crisis is, uh, is affecting municipalities in Spain. Then they are cutting uh, costs and cutting programs, and that affects to renewable energies or energy efficiency. Even uh, many of the, uh, these municipalities that in the past create uh, energy agencies now are in the, in the risk, these agencies, to promote a more clean or more, more clean way of use energies. Uh, the problem in general for municipalities now is that they are not out of the, the general framework. They want, they support us, they want to, uh, to produce energy with uh, net meter, with self-consumption, with net metering, because for them it's good. We achieve the grid parity, then they can uh, save energy using net metering and, and grid parity. But we have the problems of the central government that don't allow us to have a nice regulation. But the nice regulation does mean in this moment only that we ask them to, to give the opportunity to compete in the market. But the, we must face a strong lobby of utilities and gas companies against self-consumption and, and net metering. And then, if there is no condition that they can save money, they are not in condition now, the municipality, to put his own money. money. And then that, that means that they are stopping the, many of these programs of renewable energy. But still, there is a political interest at local level to continue. But with the economic restriction that we have to do today, the situation is much more difficult. Thank you. Mr. Wissenhagen. Yep. Uh, the question was, like, how can uh, Germany help others get involved? Um, I see two ways. One is to continue providing a good example. Um, and I, I think I feel sort of comfortable sort of answering that because I, I am German originally, but I've lived in Switzerland for 16 years, so I, I, I'm very much involved in how people in the Swiss policy debate look at Germany um, with sometimes mixed feelings. Um, and the, I think the two effects are, one, people look at Germany because there is a good example, and I think without a good example of a country really trying and, and making sure it, it works um, to, to go that path, it won't work because 
we look at global climate policy, we have the other scenario where nobody's really taking any measures and then we're surprised why nothing happens on a global level. So I think somebody needs to take the lead and, and, and Germany is a good example there. Um, at the same time, I think there's this other um, necessity to get the people sort of on board and we've seen some excellent discussions here um, in the last two days um, where if you want to get someone else involved, you need to seriously consider where they're coming from um, and you can't just say, well, in Germany the feed-in tariff was great, so please all other countries follow our lead, um, phase out nuclear, take the feed-in tariff, do everything like the Germans do, because we currently see, I think, in the euro crisis also the, the kind of backlash that's coming from some countries who feel like, well, just following the German lead is not necessarily the right solution for everyone. So I think it's this combination of, of trying to be patient and impatient at the same time, um, impatient in terms of, yes, continue to push for, for these objectives and, and really sort of give a good example, uh, but also patient in a sense of understand that other countries come from different angles and, and try to really seriously think about what could motivate them to, to join the journey. Yes. I to complement uh, in, uh, your answer, because we consider this moment Germany can play a very clear role. Uh, is continue with this good example, but we are in a workshop that, uh, that with the slow is uh, thinking in Europe. I think Germany must play this leadership, at this taking, uh, this uh, big influence, that has another aspect of the economic decision in this moment, must be extended to the energy world. We need a real energy common policy at the European level. For many years, I defend the opposite, because at this moment in the European Union, the tendency was to reduce. We had in Spain a, a good support scheme. The European Union was the tendency was to reduce or to change from uh, feeding tariff to green certificates or called market systems. But now, I think we need a real uh, energy uh, policy, common policy, and uh, Germany can play a main role to do that this, this policy must be uh, more in favor of renewable energies. I think uh, clearly Germany has a leadership in the European Union at this moment that nobody discuss, and that means must be extended to the world of uh, renewable energies. Thank you. Yes, just, just add one point. That brings up another idea, which is the, I mean, uh, an area where Germany willingly or unwillingly currently has a lot of leadership is the whole financial crisis. Um, so I think there might be an opportunity for um, Germany to bring up some new ideas of how the link could be done between solving the debt crisis of some Eurozone countries um, and actually making some progress in renewables. So um, like if, for example, uh, the, um, when it comes to Greece, um, Hans-Josef Fell mentioned this example of funding a lignite power, power plant, um, I mean, that is completely counterproductive. If somehow Germany would manage to bring in some, some new ideas of how um, financial aid could be combined with some, some sort of concrete measures in the renewables area, that would be extremely helpful. I currently don't see anybody in, in this whole sort of financial crisis um, discussion who, who has enough sort of free capacity to think about this. Um, but somehow I feel like maybe also from, from institutions like Bell Foundation, these kinds of ideas could be, could be brought up. And maybe in the end it would be something like the Abwrackprämie that Fell mentioned, um, which was very successful for cars. Why not have an Abwrackprämie for oil-fired power plants in Cyprus, for example? Okay, thank you. There was two other questions. It's over there Okay, someone is coming to help you. Yes. Yeah, geht schon. There you go. So, ja. Also, mein Name ist Preuß Christian. Ich habe nur mal eine ganz kurze Frage. Was gibt es eigentlich für einen Grund oder äh, was spricht dagegen, sozusagen die Braunkohle, solange sie da ist und auch kostengünstig gefördert werden kann, aus der Erde zu holen und zu verheizen? Und zweitens, was mich immer ein bisschen stört, ist dieser Ausdruck nachhaltiges Wachstum. Ich, in meinen Augen ist nicht ganz klar, was damit gemeint ist. Es gibt ja auch Kritiker, die sozusagen davon sprechen, dass also sogenannte Rebound-Effekte äh, dabei äh, äh, unterschätzt werden. Und zweitens, und, und dann wollte ich als drittes nur noch mal kurz anmerken, äh, also meines Wissens ist zum Beispiel auch eine chinesische Solarfirma pleite gegangen jetzt äh, zuletzt oder hat zumindest Probleme gehabt. Also es, das ist sozusagen kein, offenbar kein rein deutsches äh, Phänomen, äh, dass die Solarindustrie in der Krise ist oder so. 
Und wenn man schon von Krise spricht und über die Energieversorgung nachdenkt, ist es dann nicht an der Zeit, das Ganze ein bisschen ideologiefreier zu gestalten, gerade wenn man immer von neuen Technologien spricht und so weiter. Also ich meine, ich kann ehrlich gesagt die ganze Hysterie über das Fracking, soweit ich das weiß, nicht verstehen in Deutschland. So, das war's. Danke. Thank you for this, for this critical question. Sir. <lacht> Detlef Möser, ich habe meine Frage, äh, mich, oder mich wundert, warum äh, Thema äh, Krise, erneuerbare Energien, warum da nicht äh, über Desert Tech geredet äh, wird. Das ist ja das größte europäische Programm, äh, was ja, von der Idee her eben halt äh, so ist, dass alle europäischen Länder sich daran beteiligen sollten oder müssten, um das, äh, äh, damit das klappen soll. Wo wir jetzt jemanden, einen Vertreter aus Spanien hier haben. Äh, ich habe ja gehört, dass Spanien der Grund ist, warum das äh, nicht klappt, äh, weil Spanien ausgetreten ist aus diesem Programm. Äh, ja, kann der spanische Vertreter vielleicht etwas mehr dazu erklären, warum sie ausgetreten sind? Und im Allgemeinen, wa warum geht das trotz, äh, warum kann man äh, das nicht weiterführen, äh, auch ohne Spanien? Danke. Thank you. So I think we have questions for both of you. Okay, uh, Deserte has a strong bottleneck, These are the grids. We can do all the uh, wind farms or solar thermal platforms in uh, North Africa, but we need a grid. We have a, a, a real problem now in Spain is without desert egg. Next, next year, next week, we produce uh, wind energy that was not used by the grid because we produce too much. With an, in grid, in more connection with the grid to Europe, we can, we, can have the, we can avoid this problem. And we can put our uh, renewable energies, uh, electricity in the Europe. But if we now need to waste renewable energy, how will we introduce more energy? The problem is the grid. We, uh, Iberica, Peninsula, uh, the peninsula Iberica is more or less an island. The connections are very weak. France is the real problem because never accepted and put many barriers to develop, is to develop new connection with Europe. And in the meantime, that Europe, is a, 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 the peninsula Iberica, will continue to be an island. It's very difficult to, to do uh, profitable one project at Desert Tech because we need to have a good highways of electricity to introduce all the grid. But the real problem is not Spain, it's France. Thank you. <laughs> I have a comment from France on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I would like to intervene later, but I'll first give you the opportunity, Mr. Oosterhagen, to answer your question maybe, and then we can follow up on this. Uh, all right. The questions on brown coal or, or lignite. Um, what's wrong with taking lignite out of the ground? The problem is the is climate change. Um, the, there's different estimates, but uh, roughly there's about a, hundred, a factor 100 more carbon in the ground than we can afford to put into the atmosphere if we want to maintain the two degree target and, and sort of keep our atmosphere stable. Um, so if you agree with climate scientists that there are limits to how much carbon we can put into the atmosphere, then there's a challenge of sort of, then we need to leave some of the carbon in the ground. Simple as that. Um, and whether it's the coal or the oil or the gas that we leave in the ground is, is indifferent, but in, indeed we need to sort of limit the amount of carbon we take out of the ground and, and burn it. Uh, same with fracking. I mean, yes, it's fine to have natural gas, um, but also natural gas emits some carbon, less than coal, but still. Um, so if we just sort of move on and then sort of replace, say, in, in Switzerland there's a debate about replacing nuclear with natural gas, um, that won't necessarily help the, the CO2 problem. Plus, with fracking, there's some other issues like water usage and, and all of that. Um, the, you, you asked about sustainable growth and what does that mean and what about all the rebound effects. I think that's a very interesting question in terms of... Um, I mean, the, the, I think there's very little sort of 
sort of good economic thinking these days about what can a society look like um, with less growth or even no growth. Um, and I, I mean, I, I work at an institute that's been founded 20 years ago um, by somebody, uh, Hans Christoph Binswanger, who was one of the pioneers at the time thinking about these questions. But unfortunately, when I see how the economics departments of most universities these days um, operate, I, somehow they've lost the topic which is a pity because I think it's a very serious question that, that needs to be addressed. Um, so any work that's been done in the area would be very much welcome. Um, and, and I'd be happy to chat about how this could be brought back into universities because they are not necessarily open to, to some of these questions. Finally, Suntech, uh, the Chinese company that went into insolvency. Um, yes, it's an interesting phenomenon to look at. Um, the, 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 the background is that um, after prices have come down so, f so fast in the solar markets, um, almost nobody is sort of really is operating profitably in certain parts of the value chain, in the core parts of the value chain, making solar cells and making solar modules. Everybody's losing money over the past something like one to two years, including Chinese firms. Um, so when it came to Suntech, it was quite interesting to see that, I mean, it would have been easy for the government to step in and, and bail out the company before it went into insolvency. They didn't. Why didn't they do that? Um, I can only speculate about that, but it's interesting to observe that um, the company was founded by an, an independent entrepreneur, Dr. Xi, who used to be in Australia for some time, then went back to China, became very rich in the process of growing that company. It was on the, on the uh, front page of Forbes magazine at some point as the richest Chinese far and wide. Um, and I think in some sense it might be interesting to investigate whether there's some similarities with some Russian oligarchs who have become very rich in the energy industry and then at some point got into conflict with their governments. Um, and, I mean, yeah, it's just sort of something to, to think about. I don't have the solution there. But it's interesting for me to see that Suntech has not been saved by the government, but other companies have. Um, so there must be some differences there. Thank you. Ms. Maisonneuve, would you like to share the French perspective on the desert tech issue with us? Yes, I, I just came to, to listen to this panel, but uh, <laughs> I, I feel I have to, to answer. Uh, in terms of interconnections, uh, France is interconnected with its neighbors uh, at 48 points, so we are highly interconnected. Uh, and with uh, Spain, I, I'm not sure that uh, your question was about interconnection between France and Spain. Or yeah, uh, as you know, the negotiations on the interconnection uh, line uh, took uh, somewhat 20 years uh, the, between France and Spain, more even more. And uh, the problem was a public acceptance problem because the line had to go through a very beautiful valley in the Pyrenees, and uh, and uh, it was problem for, for local population, local NGOs. Uh, as a whole, I think that uh, France is doing its job in terms of exporting uh, electricity for when it's needed, but it's true that with Spain, the situation is difficult. And as for uh, desert tech, there is, a, in terms of grid, another initiative which, which is called MedGrid, and there France is uh, very active in that which is precisely to answer the grid questions uh, regarding the relationship with the northern African countries. But I think that for those countries, the question of interconnection between them is, uh, for me and for them, I think, a priority before interconnecting with uh, Europe because uh, they need to have uh, a market also between them in order to have a profitable investment made in, uh, in solar or wind uh, energy. Okay, thank you. Then if there are no further questions, I would like to abuse my position as a chair to ask one final question. I think we had a very interesting um, problem analysis during this workshop. Also, luckily, I would say uh, some optimism, but maybe um, because it's always nice to end with uh, conclusions and, and proposals. Um, I would like to ask one final question about what you would propose as a short-term measure to come from the problematic situation where we are in today to a more optimistic state. And especially, both of you very much stressed the problem of lack of capital um, today. Um, but how you also, Professor Houston, coming from the financial uh, sector, how would you propose to overcome um, this um, obstacle 
Um, and then also maybe I would like to give you the opportunity to respond first and how do you think that, uh, especially for Spain, this, uh, there are opportunities to overcome this obstacle of lack of capital? Okay, thank you. Um, two things. One, I think awareness is really key. Also, when I listened to the discussions yesterday um, and, and some of the European neighbors who are not so excited about the German energy vendor, I felt like one of the key arguments on their end was we don't have the same level of public awareness for these issues as Germany has. And I feel like Switzerland is in the fortunate position of being similar to Germany in terms of public awareness, but some other countries maybe aren't so much so. So I think this is very important. And I think it's also important on behalf of investors, because if you talk to investors, banks in some of those countries, um, I think there's really a, a big difference between German banks and banks in some other countries in terms of their understanding of, of renewable energy and some of the risks involved and some of the opportunities involved. So... Raising awareness, I think, is a very important prerequisite for anything that follows. Um, second, and more specifically, I think this, this um, attempt to try and, and link the financial crisis or possible solutions to the financial crisis to renewables is a very important thing and, and could represent an opportunity. Um, I don't know um, whether there's already these kinds of, of things happening, but I, I think if I were in the, the shoes of the German government, I would try to talk to institutions like the European Investment Bank or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and try to think of some creative ways of how Germany could um, sort of cooperate with these institutions, maybe also getting Switzerland on board just for the sake of having a bit more capital, um, and, and try to sort of come up with some initiatives that would... Um, sort of link uh, solutions to the financial crisis with renewable energy projects in southern Europe. Yeah. Thank you. So to make the question a little bit more concrete, Mr. Donoso, is the most important problem for the re renewable energy sector in Spain today the, the slashing of subsidies of the past couple of years or the uncertainty linked to the, the economic and, and, and euro crisis and the problem of getting funding through the banks for the renewable energy sector? Probably the uncertainty is the major problem. The financial problem maybe will be the future, but at the moment nobody is thinking into to install new wind farms or new uh, or new photovoltaic uh, farms for the regulatory risk. We need to resolve first the political problem, but uh, we need um, first. <coughs> sorry, we need to go farther. First, we need to finish with austerity, austerity policies. We need really to create development. Without development, we continue cutting budget, we continue to do that, to do this kind of policies, which Germany can do a lot, if change of his mind. And then we can continue doing programs with the municipalities, we can continue doing many things. But without finish with the development, uh, without finish with these austerity uh, policies, we don't see any exit and the, because we are in a vicious circle. So, uh, with uh, more austerity, less money that uh, the government receives by taxes. Less money, more austerity. More austerity, less money. Less money, more taxes. Then they need all the money, money to finance the debt. And then there is no money to finance any other project in the market. And then this is a very vicious cycle that don't produce any exit. Never will go will go out of this situation. And then first is to finish with this kind of policies. Second, the finish with austerity does not mean to control better the public budget, but we need development policies. And second, we need stability, regula uh, regulatory stability. We are not asking more for subsidies. We are asking only for condition to, that really we can to compete in the market. A good example is uh, the self-consumption of the metering. We don't want from the government any kind of subsidies, only fair condition to compete in the market. In this moment, in the, say before the CERTEC, we have in the, in the grid, in the Spanish national grid, apply 30 four gigawatt of people that apply to the connection to the grid saying that they can produce with photovoltaic without any subsidy, pool price. Not grid parity, pool price. And then, that means finish with the support scheme in Spain. But the government doesn't want a, even that. Really, at this moment we have overcapacity, then we need development. And we need 
this interconnection. For us, it's a priority, the interconnection with France, with it, because it's the interconnection with Europe. We, think we don't have interconnection. We have with all the problems that the moment, particularly for wind energy, that, that production that they can produce in the night, or in other moment, we can counter, counterbalance with the production in other parts of Europe, we think will be very useful for everybody and allow us to continue investing in, the, in renewable energies. Re, uh, finish with austerity, regulatory stability, and good connection with the grid with Europe. With these three aspects, and continue with research and development uh, efforts, because we think that this moment, the good of this moment of the crisis is only the real people, the serious people will continue in this market, the people that will continue with the efforts in research and development, and uh, the good will survive for the next step. Thank you. As I think lunch is already waiting for us, I would like to close the session here. I would like to thank the speakers for their very interesting reflections on the link between the crisis and uh, renewable energy, and also for giving us some hope that there are opportunities for win-win uh, situations. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thanks so much.